Thank you very much, Chairman. I appreciate your time. I have greatly enjoyed the many intellectual stimulation from all the surgeons who have been so honorable to really attend this uh, symposium. I must say that I'm not a surgeon. I'm basically a biomaterial scientist, and I want to thank all of you for educating me uh, for the last um, uh, uh, few hours. I would like to perhaps in my presentation provide you a different aspects that may help you, I'm sure, in terms of your ability to help um, young children, especially, or in the area of skull based uh, reconstruction. I will be talking today on the advanced bioresolvable scaffolds that we have developed over the last eight years and has been implanted in more than 500 patients and have got FDA and also will have CE marking in December. I must acknowledge the fact that I work very closely with clinicians and one of the aspects of clinicians that uh, took the lead are plastic surgeons, so I hope that will not cause some undue uh, sensitivity. I think many of you have already said that autogenous bone grafting remains the gold standard. Of course, there are still disadvantages in terms of the fact that you cannot conform perfectly, and then you have also the titanium mesh, and there are also potential for um, long-term host tissue response, and plus the fact that they are also available in terms of bioactive and resorbable materials, but they have also, over the last 10 years, been uh, subject to a number of criticism in terms of host tissue foreign body reactions. So the ideal material should be easy to manufacture, easily shaped, it has to be rigid but yet malleable, also inductive, bioresolvable, and more importantly, I think throughout the whole um, presentation, I heard the word that it has to be cost effective. I just want to briefly let you know the fact that there are resolvable material for the last 20 years. For example, PGA has been known uh, to have problems. It degrades too fast. You have fluid accumulation, sinus formation, osteolysis, and brittle. And then they came out with the LPLA, which also have problems in the sense that it degrades too slow. They are swelling, foreign body erection, and brittle. And this has been already been reviewed uh, by Dr. Ambrose at the Annual Biomedical Engineering uh, Journal. There are a number of orbital mesh available, and I do not have to go through all of them, but good enough for me to say that I will be focusing on this 3D scaffold based upon the fact that it has a very interesting 3D architecture that trap cells, and the idea that, that I want to introduce that we have been working heavily in the National University of Singapore is on tissue engineering concept. The importance of microarchitecture is very important and one has already noted that the cancellous bone graft revascularized, uh, it occurs very rapidly and because of its open microarchitecture has been attributed to its great success in terms as a bone graft. Compared with cortical bone, it has not been so successful. And plus the fact that I just wanted to emphasize that whatever scaffolds that we introduce, stem cells or growth factors, or any carrier, it has to be one that provide a mechanical induction. Why is this important? Mechanical forces can result in increased expression of BMP. This is known for a long time. And, but yet, we in the um, suppliers for scaffolds for materials, we have not addressed this issue adequately. It was in 1996 I visited um, Chuck Vacanti, and he was the one that inspired me. And in his work, he did tremendous amount of work to uh, illustrate to us that you can grow an organ in the laboratory and then put it back. And this has actually been a remarkable motivation for many of us, and that is the beginning of tissue engineering. But take note, it was in 1995, so 19 years have passed, so what has come out of it? And indeed, in the area of scaffolds, there has been a significant progress. In the area of tissue engineering principles, basically, we take the cells, 
sometimes add in the concoction of growth factors, and then we seed it on the scaffold, which acts as a temporary extracellular matrix, which is durable. It helps the cells to proliferate, cells to differentiate. At the same time, it provides a template when the tissue has been formed to be put back in a defect. And I think we are now at a stage, and I'm happy to know because we have been involved in tissue regeneration for quite a long time, that we are now at a stage to move from tissue regeneration to tissue remodeling. And whether we use the stem cells approach or the growth factors approach, you still need a carrier. And that is where I hope we can contribute in as much as we can. So the challenging issue is how to create a scaffold that allows mechanical induction for bone cells to remodel and a scaffold that allows easy flow of nutrients and ways for cells to grow and over the time the scaffold dissolve, leaving no synthetic material behind. It's just like building a tall building. Once the architecture is finished, we remove the scaffolds. In this particular case, when the tissue has really been remodeled or regenerated, the scaffolds dissolve, and in this case, we use a material that dissolves the carbon dioxide and water. So what are the strategies? We are concerned with long-term host tissue response. We also need to remember the load transfer principle, and we need to look at the microarchitecture. And this is the three important strategies that we have adopted in coming out with our 3D scaffolds. I just wanted to illustrate that in the case of a scaffold, it's different from a plate. If you have a plate in terms of degradation, you will find the fact that the plate just reduces in thickness. But if you take into consideration that the scaffolds are made in filament, the filament not only reduces in its diameter, but also in its porosity. And that is important. As the material degrades, are you creating enough volume for new material to take over. And that is the basic difference between a plate and a mesh, which I thought I would need to highlight. And this is what exactly we have made. That is a polycapillectal scaffold, and this scanning electron microscope shows how nicely the microarchitecture that allows the interconnectedness, which is important for cell-cell communication. And the polymer that we use is a polycapillectron that has got FDA approval and it slowly degrades into carbon dioxide and water over 12 to 18 months under hydrolytic degradation. We have found that the microarchitecture, the 3D microarchitecture, allows the bone cells to really attach in a very nice 3D fashion. We have developed a technology that integrates medical imaging, biomaterials, and advanced manufacturing. In other words, we made a platform that with a CT scan, we can customize the scaffold. In this diagram here, we have shown that in the case of a skull that has one third defect in it, we can make a scaffold exactly to the shape, and then we send it for the engineering advanced